you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, the, the OU thought they had the longest title at the, uh, at the conference this morning, so read it and weep. <laughs> Uh, we are from Rose Bruford College of Theatre and Performance. Uh, my colleague Jane Richards is the Programme Director of the Theatre Studies Online Programme. I'm the VLE Development Manager. And we're going to talk to you today about, a concise version of that, decentralising teaching materials in Moodle. Okay, the important thing to bear in mind is that Rose Bruford College is a tiny, tiny, tiny college. And we have virtually no support for our online learning except ourselves. So when we're talking about Moodle and how we use it, uh, we're talking about it on quite a, a small scale. You need to bear in mind that our course was started out as uh, a correspondence course sometime before, uh, in 1996, and has moved subsequently to DVD and then to uh, online delivery. Our initial use of Moodle, uh, we used as a sort of creative storage space, really, but uh, all it really made, uh, arrived at was a, a kind of repository for materials and a place for students to upload their, their work. And this kind of learning presupposes something called an, an andragogical set of learner assumptions, where students are expected automatically to be autonomous learners, and the direct pedagogical input was largely uh, limited. So in developing our uh, Moodle, what we needed to do was to not only think about new technologies, but new pedagogical approaches to using those technologies. So with Moodle, we had a range of different um, uh, things that would challenge us. The first thing was, um, what pedagogic function would Moodle serve for us uh, with this particular program? And what opportunities would it provide us for uh, having equivalence or parity with our online programs. Um, how might it give us what the HEA has been um, pushing towards uh, recently, the idea of flexible pedagogies, where things such as uh, championing the part-time route, uh, promoting distance education, uh, creating future-facing education, decolonizing education, and emphasizing process, and so on and so on, could become central to what we're doing. And equally interesting is Moodle's own claim of promoting a social constructivist pedagogy um, where collaboration, activities, and critical reflection um, are at the heart. You know, how can we test that out in practice? So in this presentation, we're looking at the ways we have used Moodle and have decentralized it. OK. So phase one, approximately three to four years ago, centralized teaching materials, wherein everything is contained in a course page and those materials are institutionally controlled all of the assurance the quality assurance and so on is done institutionally so those materials become the word of god it's all very well uh, we tried to develop away from that we started introducing forums we made sure that students could link out from their program pages to uh, other useful areas of the college like the learning resources center for instance but all of our content was largely text-based and that's a hangover from the, uh, the sort of orthodox read and respond distance learning mode that we're in historically. So as you can see from that schema uh, running across the bottom of the screen, um, our initial attempts to move teaching materials into, into Moodle was very much a case of taking the correspondence mode and putting it online. Mm. Uh, the tutor has no control of that content. Again, we can do all that assurance at institutional level, at program level, but the tutor's got no voice in that material. There's almost no point in hiring experts. So it'd be unfair for us to attempt to make comparisons with you know, the wide range of learning activities and experiences that a campus mode student uh, can engage with. But for us, this was a huge technological, a huge pedagogical leap. A lot of people um, today have been talking about journeys, and uh, that idea of journeys is something which is at the heart of what we want to talk about today. Because as David has said, that in a correspondence mode, no matter how um, wonderful it looks electronically, it's still largely a linear, two-dimensional process. And in that, the taught content becomes a terrain through which students have to travel. They're aided by their tutor, and they're guided en route, but their experience remains a largely solo expedition. And while they're free to plan their journey in any which way they want and take their own time over it, um, what happens on rainy days is that, fo that compass fogs up and the map, as we have learned, soon goes out of date. 
So working in Moodle, how might that change that particular picture? Well, first of all, um, it might seem that uh, we, whilst there's still a great deal of linearity within this, there's also a wealth of opportunity to acknowledge different uh, multiple pathways and different modes of learning. So there's a three-dimensionality uh, added and a complexity, which means that the choices are no longer fixed or in any kind of template. The student has um, the responsibility to navigate that particular area. The one thing we learnt very early on was that no matter um, how clear, cleverly we put things up on the page or how, or how much we put up on that page, unless we taught the students how to navigate and the skills of navigating, they weren't going to get very far with their own particular journeys. So the impact on the tutor of decentralising learning materials, by and large, is to take the word of God and give it to the clergy. So those tutors who in the past were just dealing with teaching materials that were of biblical importance, suddenly they can become uh, you know, owners and shapers of those teaching materials. We can draw on the expertise of our tutors in a much more live and immediate way as we would do with campus-based study. And it allows us to move away from the type of andragogy that, uh, that Jane des describes and towards uh, much more negotiated learning. There's more flexibility there, so we can bring in viewing and listening as modes, of, <clears throat> as modes of learning, quite apart from reading, which was always our mode in the past. The composition of the modules themselves becomes much more practice-based and much more flexible, and it allows tutors to build in project-based, case-based, problem-based, and product-based learning through developing their own activities that surround that core curriculum. In addition, we've tried to think more about how students might navigate the programme and think about their own journey and how we might help learners to learn rather than just throwing information at them the whole time and move away from this idea that content is king. As with all technologies, we're evolving modes of engagement through use. This is what has occurred for our own program. The student voice, whether it's implicit or explicit, has helped us to shape how we deliver. Now, from a developmental perspective, I think this is an important point. Moodle provides us with a technical standard or baseline that is common to all staff and students. So you arrive at a point where we've got embedded expertise, not just in a staff body, but in a student body as well, which obviously makes the smooth running of the program that much smoother, to use the word smooth twice. In one sentence. <laughs> uh, most, most recently, we've uh, installed a responsive skin on our VLE. Uh, that is um, a, a direct response to device ownership, changing device ownership, not just for our distance learners, but for the on-campus learners as well, where smartphone ownership is at 100% pretty much. So changing patterns of usage with how they interact with the VLE. Okay, we're now looking at the impact on the student. Um, and one of the things we discovered was that no matter um, how clear the remit is at program level, how the student arrives at that remit will be unique to them. And we want to suggest that focusing on skills such as reflection and teaching learners how they learn um, re is really important to encouraging them to develop particular habits of practice. Using Moodle and web-based learning does promote opportunities for student-led um, unstructured learning as well as tutor-led structured learning. So again, that flipping idea comes into play. This is supported by scholarship, uh, which suggests that the processes of navigation themselves uh, promote focus on the students' individuality and identity, and these are central to the learning experience. Students, our students spend a great deal of time working independently, and Moodle has provided a means by which they can engage in their studies regardless of where they are or whether they're on the move. But by decentralising the materials, in other words, allowing the tutors to bring in materials of their own and for students to contribute uh, things from their own learning environment to the, um, to the processes, it's not a locked down terrain any longer. It opportuni opportunities open up for students to go on sorties of their own discoveries and uh, to bring in um, skills of autonomous study. In this way, we've managed to improve the currency, variety and range of the materials um, and make far more of the college's online resources. It's been a useful opportunity as well to, to change the way we um, uh, build our, our learning and, and, and look at more chunked learning and to amplify the currency of the programme. 
Okay, so <clears throat> finally, the impact on the administrator, and this is the program administrator now rather than a, a Moodle site admin, for example. Delivering a distance learning program through the post is hellishly labor intensive and hellishly expensive. So having advantage of uh, all of the efficiencies that online learning can bring has been incredibly valuable to us, especially as a small HEI. Increasing the scale of flexible materials means that over time, uh, the core materials actually go down, you know, and more of that ownership is given over to tutors, and in the fullness of time, hopefully given over to students. Submitting assignments through Moodle, they come in quicker, we mark them quicker, we return them quicker. Very, very popular, drives up your NSS scores as well. Moodle's made it much easier for us to address problems as they arise, so if student, student A uploads the wrong file now, we can address that immediately whereby in the past, they, you know, student B puts the wrong file on the post, that could be potentially weeks before that is sorted out for them. Um, we can monitor online attendance now, and we can use the statistics that we generate there to you know, better support student retention and attainment. We hope, confidently we say, our use of Moodle from a web design perspective has improved, so we're thinking a lot more carefully about what should appear, how, who sees it and when. And meanwhile, of course, you'll know this, you know, Moodle itself continues to improve all the time. So there are efficiencies to be gained there in terms of e general ease of use, staff training and development. Towards conclusions here, I think the most important um, point to begin with is that students might join a programme, any programme, with experience of using Moodle or other platforms in the past. But to, to assume that they automatically know how to navigate the new version of Moodle or what is expected of them is it, in it um, uh, is something that uh, needs to be rethought. Okay. We, we see Moodle as being one of the sort of value added for e-learning. Um, so not only does TEL place emphasis on process rather than product, its alinearity and evolutionary nature creates hypertext, which encourages multifarious ways of thinking essential to the nature of degree level learning. I'm sure you'll agree. And students spend the bulk of their time learning you know, individually and alone. It's the, it's the nature of the beast with distance learning. Moodle can obviously help to mitigate that in a variety of different ways. There's a facility for sharing that was never there before. Again, thinking back to the days of a, you know, an orthodox print-based correspondence course, communities of practice are coming into existence. And what we start to see is you know, the, the level of traffic that is rooted through us, sort of emails about nothing, just students reaching out. That starts to go down when there's more opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer support and peer-to-peer -peer learning and so on. Uh, and finally, what we're finding is there, there'll always be comparisons to be made between you know, what's possible in actual on-campus participation and what can go on in, uh, you know, in virtual worlds, in virtual environments. But increasingly, I think we're realizing that online learners are doing this out of choice. You know, there's not a reason why one, choose, why one you know, is forced to study online or forced to do distance learning. People are coming to this out of choice. They want to be selective. They want it to be personalized. And hopefully, increasingly, we're meeting them halfway. Just finally, um, we can say that Moodle um, can provide a constructivist model of learning, but not in isolation. It only becomes an active, dynamic force through recognition of how it might be navigated. And so with consistent, intrepid, curious, and purposeful investigation, it can become an empowering and forward-facing tool and help promote social learning. By decentralizing materials within Moodle, we feel we have succeeded in um, inviting a more intensive inquiry into how students learn as opposed to what they learn. Thank you very much. <laughs>